News alert from the Hillsborough County Courthouse today, where a short time ago, a jury reached a decision in the sentencing of Ronnie O'Neill. that the mentally ill are responsible for their actions? If you ask Greek philosopher Plato, he would say no. And that's the epitome of empathy back then, because in that day and age, having a mental illness was looked at in a completely different light. You were considered cursed, or maybe even possessed. Did you know that more than 80% of people who are diagnosed with a mental health disorder claim to hear voices in their head or often report feeling under attack? One out of every 10 people will hear voices or what specialists like to call auditory hallucinations. But when it happens, most of us don't even notice. It's a luxury that we regret to appreciate. But for the ones who do hear loud and clear, they often succumb to the voices and often act out in fits of rage. November 13th, 1984. The world would make way for Kenyatta Baron. The place that she would call home in her early years would be the Hillsborough County area of Florida. It would be here that she would begin to learn about life. She would attend elementary here and ultimately work her way up to college, where she would be attending Hillsborough County College to further her education. Kenyatta is described as thoughtful. She was a friendly person. They describe her as genuine. She's described as a person who could easily capture your attention. And in the year of 2006, she would capture the attention of a young male, a guy who goes by the name of Ronnie O'Neill III. The beginning of this relationship was a normal relationship. You know, these guys were together and they were in the middle of the honeymoon phase, but life had other plans. Shortly after courting each other, she would find out that she was actually pregnant. And in 2008, they would welcome into the world their first child. Ron Avea would be born and she would be a light for everyone around her. Ron Avea would be born with cerebral palsy as well as being diagnosed as an autistic. One of the effects of this is it deemed her nonverbal. She couldn't communicate. She would quickly become the center focus of this relationship. But one year later, a few changes would be made because one year later they would welcome another child, a son, a son that would take on the name of his father. His name would be Ronnie O'Neill the fourth. So is just Kenyatta, her boyfriend and a loving family. But behind the scenes and the photos of the smiling children and mother was a completely different story and things were on a rocky road. In this relationship, financial burden was one of the leading factors and the cause for problems in the relationship itself. Her boyfriend was in between the streets and working jobs, but although life was stressful, he always seemed to make a way. The bills were paid and the children had a roof over their head and things would be okay into the year of 2016 because that's when this couple would face their first real test. It would be this year that Ronnie O'Neill III would have an outside relationship and inside of this outside relationship they would conceive a child. But although this situation happened, in the end Kenyatta Barron and Ronnie O'Neill decided to bury the hatchet and move forward with their family. The following year, in the year of 2017, Ronnie O'Neill would be shot and he would end up in the hospital. Now, needless to say, he survived this altercation. And even though they didn't have the best of the relationship, Kenyatta Barron was right there by his side. 
but also in the hospital alongside of him would be the nation of Islam. This was something that he had began to practice and after he survived this altercation, he got heavy into it. But even though he had found this new calling, the trouble persisted in his home. They still had domestic disputes. In fact, the police were actually called out a few times for minor incidents. Towards the end of the year of 2017, Ronnie would begin to act odd. You know, people described him as being erratic, irrational, um, hot-headed. He was beginning to take on a completely different personality. He would even tell people on multiple occasions that he was fighting demons. The year is now 2018. Kenyatta Barron and Ronnie O'Neill are still trying to work things out, but Ronnie isn't changing. His behavior is becoming even more erratic. Outside of the normal relationship issues, Kenyatta Barron and Ronnie O'Neill would also be arguing about religion. This is an argument that occurred frequently in this home. And on the night of March 18th of 2018, Ronnie O'Neill would do the unthinkable. It would be this night at 11.43 p.m., police would receive a call. A call from Kenyatta Barron herself. In this phone call, Kenyatta Barron is extremely frantic. She's hurt. She's telling the dispatch that she's been shot. And in the background, someone is yelling. The police then immediately spring into action and they send a few units over to the home. But upon arriving on the scene, the police would be too late. They would find the body of Kenyatta Barron laying on the ground at a neighboring home. The police have now responded to a call at the home of Kenyatta Barron. And sadly, when they arrive, they find her. But upon arrival, Ronnie O'Neill is also outside. He's belligerent, he's acting out, and it takes the police to use force just to get him into custody. So when they get him into custody, they go through the proper procedure. They begin to search the home, but when they get inside of the home, they get more than they bargained for. An eight-year-old Riverview boy telling deputies that he saw his father shoot his mother, and that woman and a little girl are now dead. Deputies found Barron dead outside a neighbor's house after making a frantic 911 call. When deputies found Barron's body, they noticed the house next door was on fire. In this exclusive video, you can hear investigators react to seeing an eight-year-old boy walk out of the home with horrible stab wounds, telling deputies his father shot his mother. Neighbors call the boy Little Ronnie. After rescuing Little Ronnie, investigators tell us they found a young girl stabbed to death inside the burning home. Deputies also tell us they found a man named Ronnie O'Neill III inside the home smelling like gasoline. They had to use a taser to take him down. Right now, O'Neill is charged with taking two lives and trying to kill his young son who shares his name. Shortly after being arrested, it would be ultimately concluded that he was incompetent and wasn't ready for trial. So they would postpone it. Meanwhile, Ronnie O'Neill is sent to a psychiatric ward, and it would take years before the trial would even officially start. But finally, on June 14th of 2021, his trial would begin. And when the trial began, it sent the media into a frenzy. His opening statement would go viral, with many people saying he was out of his mind. I think the worst part about this entire trial is them allowing him to cross-examine his son who witnessed the entire situation. 
Now, when Ronnie O'Neill decided to defend himself, that became his given right. Although the prosecution had way more than they even needed to convict this guy. Calling his son on the stand was not needed for a conviction, but for entertainment purposes, they allowed him to drag his son through this emotional event. What happened in that home that day was nothing short of tragic. It's completely sad. But I also feel like it's a situation that could have possibly been prevented. When people come up to you and say they're fighting literal demons, if they seem off in the head, it's okay to report those people. Don't just go about your day as if this is normal life. This didn't come out of thin air. It's no secret that Ronnie, the days leading up to this event, he was off in the head. Many people testified to this. He told numerous people he was fighting demons. He told numerous people he felt under attack. And yet somehow he was able to walk around in free society as if nothing was wrong. I think the problem in this day and age is we take a word such as fighting demons and then we use it too often, so often that it loses its power. Now, when people say they're fighting demons, most people don't mean in a literal sense. They mean they're trying to conquer their troubles. But when some people say it, they mean it. When his opening statement went viral, I was disgusted. He started popping up all over the headlines. He started gaining a lot of attention in the media. But you need to stop and ask yourself the question, why did they let a mentally ill man represent himself in court? It's not a secret. We can all see he was a little off in the head and he still is. But why was he allowed to represent himself? I believe for two reasons, political gain and personal gain. You see the prosecutors, the legal teams, they all want their fair share of this spotlight that he has placed on this case. So they were willing to do any and everything they could to keep it in the headlines for personal gain. There's a part of you that can be very charming and very likable. And with all due deference to your counsel, they're all excellent lawyers, excellent lawyers. But I have to tell you, I think that your representation of yourself also aided in saving you from the death penalty. I really do. I really think that. I could be wrong, but that's just my best guess. Any person with any feeling could have witnessed or seen the photos of what occurred that night and not be haunted for the rest of your life. I know I will be. For the rest of my life, I'll be haunted by what I saw as far as the evidence and just the abject cruelty of it all. The abject cruelty. And all I can think about, because I, I knew that Miss Barron was not with you romantically at the time, and I knew that she just out of the goodness of her heart let you come stay with her. And it is beyond tragic that that critical decision ended in so much horror for her and for her children. It is unspeakably cruel what happened as a result of that one decision. As count one, Mr. O'Neill, I will adjudicate you guilty, sentence you to life in prison, with a minimum mandatory of life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the beginning of this video, I asked you all, do you think that the mentally ill are responsible for their actions? And I guess that question was rhetorical in a sense because in a situation like this, we all know the answer. Please let this story be a reminder that people need to be checked on. And if you check on them and something seems off, act upon it because you never know what you might be preventing. Rest in peace, Kenyatta Barron and Ronavea O'Neill. Thank you for being a life for others. Tonight we introduce you to the little boy who survived that horrific night and is now thriving with adoptive parents who brought him into their home. News Channel 8's Jeff Patterson joining us now with his exclusive report about little Ronnie and how Ronnie's life has changed for the better. I cannot promise you a life of sunshine. I cannot promise riches, wealth, or gold. 
I cannot promise you an easy pathway that leads away from change or growing old, but I can promise all my heart's devotion, a smile to chase away your tears of sorrow, a love that's ever true and ever growing, a hand to hold in yours through each tomorrow.